probably people don't even know this, and I'm gonna tell y'all this, this is the first time y'all probably ever heard this, ain't no brown squirrels in Detroit. <laughs> ain't no more brown squirrels no more. But see, y'all don't know that. Y'all looking confused and befuddled, because y'all don't know. Because the only time y'all come here is when the Tigers is playing. <laughs> then y'all get drunk and leave and hop y'all ass on the white Underground Railroad, which is 75 North, and take y'all ass back on home. Man, the car like, don't look to the left or the right, you'll feel bad, just look straight. <laughs> We're almost at Hazel Park, you can look out there. This shit ridiculous, man. All we got is these aggressive ass black squirrels taking over our neighborhood. And these squirrels ain't scared of shit. I'm serious, though. They ain't scared of nothing. Gunshots, police cars, Dr. Pepper bottles, they not scared of nothing. <laughs> Fuck the squirrel gonna knock on my door, tell my ass to use your phone charger, cuz. I'm like, what, nigga? Get off my porch, Black Squirrel. You got a goddamn Galaxy 7 before you blow up my porch. Get off my porch. I ain't took my trash out of two weeks fucking with these squirrels. What's up, man? It's your boy, comedian Josh Adams, inviting everybody out to the I'm Scared of Detroit comedy show, October 26, 8 p.m., starring me, Jason Jamerson, Martini Harris, Foolish, and Coco. You ain't gonna wanna miss this show. I'm telling y'all, get y'all tickets right now. <clears throat> All right, we are in full effect. We are in full effect. Detroit is different, the of podcast course. with uh, one of the anchors of the Detroit is different after dark network. The franchise. Y'all come over there and listen. We cuss on this side, but I'm not gonna cuss today. Yes, yes. Josh Adams, the comedian, the What's writer, yeah. the producer. Comedian, and you know what I'm saying? Actor, uh, visionary, creator, influencer, father, all those things. Yep, yep. Also, uh, being a father, you a son. Your your granddad uh, yeah, yeah. is in more so effect as far as your father right now. He was just in town for a second, but he comes from Mississippi way Philadelphia. up to the D. Yeah, Philadelphia, Mississippi, where the racism was invented at. That's where they started and they tried it and it was all this work and then they ran with it. And that's kind of where we always start these Detroit is different stories. Okay. Uh, family, where did they come from? What led them to Detroit? Why did they come to this area? All right, Pops, Philadelphia, Mississippi. Uh, older dude, you know what I'm saying? I think he was born, I want to say 46. And uh, mom, Buffalo, New York, went to school with Rick James. I was so, going to say Rick James from Buffalo's. Yeah, yeah, that's when my mom She went to school with Rick James. So Are you serious? Hopefully he didn't get a hold to her, but he probably did. He was that oh, man. Is. You know what I'm saying? So I got Rick James on one side, and then I got Mississippi Burnings on the other side. So I fall in the middle of all that. What led your mom to come to the D? Uh, what led my mom to come to, uh, to Buffalo? I'm from Buffalo to, to Detroit. Bro, you know what? I don't know. I never ever asked her what brought her here. I know what brought my dad here. He came from Mississippi, and my oldest sister's mother cohorts him to come out to move to New York, and then she cheated on him, and then from there, he ended up in Detroit with one of his boys, and it was one of those things where the whole family follows the older brother or, the, or mm -hmm. one of the, you know, the one who was brave enough to step out. So after he moved to Detroit, everybody else came to Detroit, and then they from there was like, oh, all right, well, we're going to go to Chicago or Indiana. But I don't know what brought my mom to Detroit. I probably had to ask her that. That's crazy. I don't know what made it. I never thought about that. I don't know why my mama ended up here, dog. I don't know. I'm going to just say uh, doing hair. I'm going to make up something. All right. So with that, you talked about your dad came up this way. Uh, did any brothers, sisters, followers? You got like uncles, aunts, this in the area? Yeah. But the funny thing is they all moved up here. Mm -hmm. uh, my aunt and uh, who all moved up to Detroit? My dad. My aunt and. Uh, of course, my older sister, she moved up here and like they all end up moving back. Like, mm. like I think like once I graduated, not because of me, but it got to a point where my dad literally once I graduated high school, I didn't graduate all the way or did I? Yeah. Once I graduated high school, my pops was like, yep, I am already retired from he was working for uh, Oakland County Road Commission. So he was there for about 30, 40 years. He was like, yep, um, you out of school. I'm going to take this check and move back home. He moved back home, and literally everybody else started the dominoes that all fell back, failed to come up here that came to follow him. Them dominoes fell all the way back, and they all moved back to Mississippi and stuff like that. So, Ain't that something? Yeah, so my aunt, and I think at one point in time, it was just my, it was literally my dad, my aunt up here, and then in, in Chicago was my Uncle Willie. Then Indiana it was my aunt, my, uh, my aunt Vert in Chicago as well. They they literally Arnell's still in Indiana, but everybody else moved back. And my uncle Willie's still in uh, Indiana, but everybody else, and you know, 
talking to the head, not the heart. I just I can't really remember. Most of them are back down in Mississippi now. Like they ended up back home. Mm. All right. So what neighborhood, Detroit? What neighborhood did your people, you know, reside or run in? All right. Well, when my pops moved up here, uh, I don't. I'm not gonna act like I remember because I was totally. I'm not aware of where they was at before I became conscious of what was going on. But I remember being born over there off of uh, um, Davison and the Puritan area. And we stayed on Belden. Mm. Yeah, we stayed on Belden. And they had property over there. Like, my dad came up here and started buying up property. So we had, like, a crib that we stayed in. And my aunt, I remember my aunt standing there. But I didn't know as a kid that we had owned the other property next door. And literally, uh, my, my auntie burned down the crib that we owned. And they said that. I somehow walked out of the house at like four, when, even though the house was on fire, walked out the house and walked next door to my auntie's house. So I don't know what that was all about. So uh, mm. I, that was just one of the weird stories that they tell you. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We was over there off of Belden and um, Living Noise, like right over there, not too far from the uh, Black Orchid. All you old school cats who listen mm-hmm. to this know what the Black Orchid is. Yeah, most definitely. People definitely still over know there. about the uh, Black Orchid. Um, one of the, I guess, original gentlemen's clubs or strip clubs in Detroit. Yeah, that was a spot. I, from what I heard, I wasn't old enough to go in there. So, yeah, it's still over there, though, across the street from uh, the Soul Food spot. Yeah, well, you know, Uptown Barbecue. Uptown. But I would say Maze Printing. Well, but, I don't know what that know. is. That, is that still <laughs> over there? Nah, at, well, the building's still over there. And Maze is, like, going into a whole new iteration of how they do business uh mm-hmm. as i remember old digital. man mr mays they digital or is it just yeah they doing like more digital stuff but mm-hmm. for a long time like almost every funeral program you can think of like a lot of the like souvenir books and things like that it was maze printing that's, that's where, where you just went yeah okay yeah 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 so uh yeah, yeah yeah we was over there in that area so that's pretty much the area that we was in and from there uh we moved to oak park my dad got us out. No, no, no. I take that back. From over there, we moved to Seven Mile in Wyoming, not too far from the high school. You were the Jesuits. Mm. And I went to McDowell over there. Okay. You remember anything about school back in McDowell? Yeah. I remember uh, I remember um, being over there and, like, the first time, like, messing up. Like, you know, I remember somebody had a bad report card, and they was like, I'm not taking this to my mama. And I remember saying the same thing. You know, my report card wasn't bad. I just was like. Being a kid and following a friend of mine and hiding mine and my mama found out. And I remember that was the first time getting in trouble, getting a whooping hmm. for some stuff that it was like, why did you do that? Your poor car wasn't even bad. You just was doing something because somebody else was. And um, what else happened over there in that area, man? I mean, it was just like just that was me remembering like being remembering things as far as like, oh, man, yeah, I did this. I did that more like just. I always say being conscious of what's going on because you just as a kid, like certain age, you just kind of moving around and somebody taking you around. You don't know what's going on. But I remember stuff starting to stick and being stuff that kind of turned you into who you was going to be starting when I moved over to the Seven Mile of Wyoming and living in that crib over there. Eighty six twenty Seven Mile Road. OK. All right. Now. From there to Oak Park. Like, you were in Oak Park, like, that's like the 90s era, correct? 92, 93. So, like, I grew up, like, that's why I, I tell people I'm from Oak Park because I was mm-hmm. there the longest. And that's why I really think all my programming started at from there. Like, I like I said, I remember being conscious on 7 but, like, everything took place that locked in was from them years of 92 all the way till I left. Oak Park, you know what I'm saying? Now, that relationship between when you think about, like, Lathrop, Oak Park, Southfield, especially that era in the 80s, 90s, you know, it was, uh, like, oasis almost of, like, black sustainability, Mm -hmm. uh, success. It was one of those things where a lot of the people from these neighborhoods moved and said, okay, I want to be in Oak Park. I want to be in Lathrop. I want to be in Southfield. What was it like connecting with the kids? Because it's still all families from Detroit that Mm -hmm. just moved over that way. But, uh, yeah, like when you moved from – that was the come up. It was like, all right, you made it. I guess you can say you made it. It was like, all right, bet the leap from Detroit – so Park was so different because when we moved out there, we was literally like that's when middle class meant something. It was like if you was out there, you had a good amount of paper. Y'all was straight. You was a two car home. You know what I'm saying? Two car family. And you know what I'm saying? The money stretched out and you was renting movies every other day. You had a VCR. We had a camcorder. We had a birthday party with uh, ponies there. It was just weird. Like I remember actually having like being like, oh, we 
not being rich, but like, all right, money wasn't a thing. We ate what we wanted, did what we wanted, got what we wanted. So uh, moving out there was a culture shock. It was the first time I ever seen a Chaldean person in my life. Like, mm. seeing, like I, I remember it was a point that I only remember black people and being around black people. And moving to Oak Park was like every day I was like, oh, what kind of people are these? And it was like Chaldean people, like, and having to go to school with them and learning their language and I think really, like, it wasn't too many all straight, like just straight white, white, white people there. It was just all, it was black, county, and that was it. And when we moved in over there on Jerome, we was literally one of the two, maybe, how many, one, two, three, it was like three black families over there. It was us, it was these people down the street, and it's my boy named Hillary, who, like one of my best friends to this day, like I've known him longer than I've known anybody. Mm -hmm. And I still hang out with Hillary. He came out and we kicked it. That's my man. That's my guy. So, uh, yeah, and then as time went by, more black people started to move in. They opened up enrollment at Oak Park, and then it turned into like, uh, it turned into like the embassy of Detroit. Like it was like, all right, this where you come when you just want to. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it ain't the hood, but it ain't the suburbs no more. And all the Caldean people started moving to Sterling Heights and all that. <laughs> they kept going. They started going up and up as far and east as they could. Up. Yeah, but yeah. they they kept their businesses over there, but they wasn't living over there because you yeah. would go in next door to us. It was a person. The people next door to us owned the corner store. And it was like four generations of people in that house. And I watched those generations get older and the younger ones get older and older. And they was the ones running the store. And then it was a younger generation. And they just kept it moving like that. And then it was like, you know what? We selling this house. We'll let them have it. And we moving out to Sterling Heights and uh, out into uh, Mount Clemens and all that stuff. But they would keep their businesses. All right. So as you watch that transition, and that's what happened into a lot of the Detroit neighborhoods. And when you say Oak Park, it's also a strong Jewish community over there too. Um, because this was originally a Jewish neighborhood. Yep. You witnessed something that like my mom witnessed growing up as like one of the few black families. This mm -hmm. this house, this block, they were the third black family on the block. That and us, within yeah. about five years, they say it was basically all black. Same thing I saw. Mm -hmm. Five years, it was like, and I remember us being, them looking at us crazy, and then the more black people moved in, we was looking at the black people crazy, like, what are they doing over here? And it was like, this is just what it is now, bro. It was like, it was, uh, <clears throat> people were just, I don't know if the houses, I don't know if we lowered the value of the houses or whatever, and people made it cheaper, or people just start getting more money. It was just like, people start moving to Oak Park. I think, I think a lot of that stuff is like the chicken or the egg, but along racial lines, you know, as I've studied in my own, this is Kari Frazier bias, uh, property values go a lot with school systems. And school mm -hmm. systems are really dictated a lot by, they'll say test scores and things like that, which can be very culturally biased, as we know. But, you know, the more black students that are in the school system, the they'll say the worse that school system is. And the worse that school system is impacts the property values, mm -hmm. impacts, hence, if black people are in the neighborhood, Property values are generally going to be locked. Oak Park was super black. Like once I got to high school, and that's why they sent my little sister to Ferndale, and she got mm. a way better education than I did. But you know, it was just a, it was a it was just a matter of just like all right, Ebony, going here because we see what's up at Oak Park. Now, uh, yo, yo, sister, what's the age difference? Uh, if I'm 35, Ebony is 32. Okay, so what was it like being a big bro uh, over there? Was it were you like, you know? always you know keep it walking with her like uh i had to play with her watch her and everything like that ebony was like uh we didn't we had a relationship it's kind of funny how it's different now but it's like we had a relationship you know it's probably still the same but we had a relationship of, like i was older brother she was a little sister she got on my nerves she i got on hers she would get me in trouble for stuff and then would cry when i would get a whooping so almost like she didn't like me, but didn't want nobody messing with me. So, like, even though you got me in trouble and my mama was going to whoop me, she would be crying, and that would be weird. And then she didn't want nobody messing with me, but she was straight up. I remember this girl named Jackie that I was in the same school, like, same grade with. She had did something to me, and I couldn't do nothing to her because she was a girl. And my sister, I remember this. Like, she did something to me. I mean, let's say she hit me. And I remember walking to the house, and Ebony seen that. And Ebony was sitting on our porch. I watched her jump off our porch, take three steps, and jump up. And slapped this girl, and the girl had glasses, and the glasses fell off her face, and Ebony ran back to the house. And three year difference is totally is a big deal That's when you a, talk about ten myself, and like, seven. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Then thirty yeah. and thirty two. I mean thirty five and thirty two. So it was like she was smaller mm -hmm. little, but Ebony just was a little firecracker at that time. But you know, Ebony was just like you know she, she's my little sister. You know what I'm saying? I ain't think much of it. We got into it. We stayed into it. 
and um and now she a lawyer and she loved my daughters to death and she you know she practically their second mama outside mm-hmm. of their real moms they are real moms in their life but it was just she they they was like Ebony going to school and I mean I think they kind of decided at a certain point they knew what we was gonna be they was like all right Ebony is the one who's smart as hell like well not even smarter she just applies herself better mm-hmm. and me I was more into sports and. Being silly and all that, I think they looked at me like I don't know what this dude finna be, but he ain't school ain't really on his top priority list. They was like Ebony gonna go to school, which she ended up going to Western, getting her degree. Shout out to the Broncos, and then she went from Western to Ole Miss and got her degree uh, uh, in law and passed the bar back here in Michigan, and now she a lawyer. So I'm suing people if y'all trip. All right, so that connection is a unique connection when you think about that bond. But along with that bond, growing up and having that perspective, being one of those first black families over there, were you kind of like an OG in your hood? Were you like that dude on the block that, you know, people look to like, all right, we're going to go through Josh for this or that? Yep, that's crazy. That Now that you think about it, like literally, like it, uh, Old Park was broke down into almost like sections. I can't really break it down as far as like what side was what directional wise, but it was our side of the city and it was another side and it was like it wasn't no gangster stuff because we was all from the suburbs even though it wasn't no it wasn't no punks over there but it was like they kept it all in a sense of mm-hmm. like you know all right that's josh i held i held whatever rank i did i was who i was i was a funny guy i played sports i was good at sports so i got that love for that and uh <clears throat> yeah no, i mean i was cool like i never really i never really had to fight nobody because i was always like just due to the, the fact that who i was around I guess, I mean, I never thought about it. I hung around the dudes. Like, when you funny, people like that don't, you too much, you always kind of good. You got, like, a past. You're almost like a, a, what's the word, a diplomat. Like, you can come and say and do what you want for the most part, and ain't nobody going to let too much happen to you. And that was kind of, like, how it always was. So, I definitely was, like, a big dog, but I ain't going to say I was super tough. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But nobody ever really tried me, so I don't know how tough I was because I never had to try to be nothing more than who I was. So with that, that brings like one of the anchors in just a story Detroit culture too. Mm-hmm. That I gotta bring up America's first mall. Mm-hmm. Northland. Yeah. Northland stories that had to have been the spot for you. Yeah, Northland was one of them spots, bro, where uh that was the first time you probably ever stole something from somewhere. You probably got your first <laughs> number from Northland. The AMC over there, like literally right now we're at Kroger's. And uh, that Outback Steakhouse is at. Mm-hmm. That used to be the that was the, that was the movie theater that everybody would go to. It was the first time you probably seen somebody fight. So like Northland, first time you seen somebody <laughs> for real. Like like I mean, you seen somebody like get jumped or something crazy like that because even though it was in Southfield, Detroit was literally right there. So it's like whatever bus, like the bus hub was right there. So yeah. everybody from there would walk over to the movie theater. Yep. And, you know, Oak Park is right here. Southfield, Northland is literally in the middle of Southfield. You got all these different things happening and all these different interactions to where, you know, Oak Park, we was we was sheltered because it was, like, super safe, man. Like, I would leave the house in the summertime, bro, at, like, 9 in the morning and not come back till probably 10, 11 at night. And my mama didn't trip. Cause, and we will be walking, riding bikes. It's no place my footprints ain't been at in Oak Park. Literally everywhere, every street. I knew somebody and we walked up and down them and we never had a problem. It was like the safest thing in the world. And that's what I want to get to my kids being like, you know, I mean, one of them be like, Hey, I ain't worried about my kid. They'll be straight. Like I literally had one of them lives that how my parents was like, back in the day, you can grow up though. You know, you could leave and woo woo. Like we literally had that kind of life. So, um, Northland played a huge role in it, bro. Like, you know, that's where you first bought your pair of shoes. That's where we go shopping at. Like, that was our mall, bro. Like, that's where we would go get on at. Like, for real, for real. All right. Tell us some stories about Northland that you remember. Uh, oh, man. It was, uh, I mean, it's just a lot happened, man. I mean, it was a lot. When I was older, like, I remember, like, uh, going there and I've been going there and buying a pager, bro. Like, going there buying, like, this, how, I mean, I just re- saying this out loud. Let me know I'm old. Like, I had a pager, and I know some people like, what is a pager? Like, I remember walking in there buying a pager. It was light blue, and I, for some reason, had an eight ball on it. I don't know why I had somebody put an eight ball on it, but, and I didn't even have nobody to really page. It was just, like, people, like, I remember going there buying pagers, buying stuff from Max Greens. Like, Max Greens had all the <laughs> outfits in there that was super cheap, like, weird material. And then they had a Max Greens, too. <laughs> Cause they had so much extra cheap material, they needed another store, so man. Much extra cheap um, wow, what else happened in there? 
we used to go there. Me and my mom and we used to go to see, go to Ogus and eat. They had an Ogus in there, and I used to love Ogus until I found out that the meat we was eating was a uh, lamb. Even though the meat was delicious, it was just something about me finding like this. What kind of meat, cause? And I never ate it again. And that was my first time seeing a gay person. I remember my mama saying like it was a gay dude in there, and she was like, he gay. And I remember looking, she's like, don't stare at him though, cause they'll they they'll spaz out. And I was like, what? And I didn't know what it was. And then like since then, I remember now like you seeing a gay person was like seeing Haley's comment. It was like, and you would stare at him and be like, what is this thing? What? And now every day you see a gay person. So shout out to y'all. Y'all really doing y'all thing. But I remember that as a kid, that changed my life. Mom was like, look at that gay man. And it was just a gay dude. And he he definitely didn't act like what I was accustomed to a man acting like. And my mom was like, don't stare at him because they are, right. they're now, spaz out. Now the change in Northland, as they say, as well, Chris Rock say, you got the mall white people used to go to and <laughs> the wall mall white people go to. Mall shopping is completely different, but I think it's like a fixture in America of Detroit culture of Northland. When did you start noticing like, okay, Northland completely has changed? Like, I mean, it never was black people there when I remember going there. I mean, I mean not never. It was always black people there. It was never no I never even seen a white people I don't even think white people worked at Northland. Like Hilarious. it was a mall straight. Hilarious. <laughs> Uh, attended and operated by, by black us, people. bro. Yeah, period. But when did you start seeing the change, though? bro? Till you just said, I, I just thought about that. Like mm-hmm. that was our mall. Like I remember that was our mall, and then it went to a point where it was like you graduated once you had a friend with a car, where you start going to Fairlane, and then mm-hmm. I didn't even know Somerset was a thing till I got old enough to know that like, oh, this is where the white people shop at. Hilarious out there, like oh, and, and everything people would buy from. Somerset seemed to be so much better than Northland and Fairlane. It was like, oh, okay, yeah, I went to Cinnabon. It's like the Cinnabon ain't better in, at Somerset than it is in Fairlane's a Cinnabon. But just because you went there, it just seemed like because they had all the Gucci and all this Louis Vuitton and all the Balenciaga. But uh, now that I'm sitting here talking to you, 2019 19, going on yeah. 20, I never think I've ever saw a white person in Northland. Walking through there, even walking around, doing a little walking thing with the older white people, older people walking around, mm-hmm. or operating. It was black as ever in there, bro. Now that I think about it, bro, now that not that's just me. Maybe I'm being mm-hmm. a little weird about it. No, no, nah, nah, it was it was some white folks in there, but it was them. definitely pr- primarily black folks. But ninety nine, I started 6%. noticing the change in Northland when I noticed it was an actual beauty supply store in the mall. Anytime it's a beauty supply around. It definitely Black people is, is not is literally they there they 150 mile yeah. radius of that place. Anytime I go somewhere in the world, I'm like, all right, take me to the beauty supply. Then I know I can find black people. If it ain't no beauty supply, probably ain't no black people around here. Mm. The macaroni and cheese is terrible in that area. If it's no <laughs> beauty supply, so once like you said, if, if they put a beauty supply in there, white people automatically it's almost like they're not coming in that area. They're like, no, nah, it's uh but that. And shea butter around here or, or, or Luster's Pink Lotion. You're yeah. not going to be nowhere in there. And then they closed the... Uh, and then it's like, it was weird because I think they closed like one entryway at a, a Macy's. Uh-huh. And I was like, what, what's going on with this? Bro, they had Northland. Bro, I don't think... It, I can't think of nothing in there white people were buying. Like, what was... They didn't sell nothing in there for white people. Like, everything we had was shoes. We had outfits. White mm-hmm. people don't buy outfits. They buy clothes. Like, we buy complete outfits from head to toe. White people don't. They go buy shirts, pants, and jackets. We buy outfits, and that's what Northland had. They had outfits, shoes. Shirts, pants, and jackets. Yeah, they buy <laughs> articles of clothing. We buy whole outfits when we go out, bro. So it was like. Well, definitely a lot of people was copping, like, um, copping them guest fits around the end, I remember. Yeah. And uh, we was buying uh, uh, a Netflix. Uh, Netflix. Uh, What's the phones? Uh, I can't even think of them right now. What's the phones like? No, 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 no. The ones you can chirp on. Oh, oh, oh. Nextel. Nextel. I'm gonna say Netflix. Yeah. yeah, white people that had them. Um, Nextel. That was us, bro. Like, man, we had them in there. Come on, dog. That was a black mall. Mo- that was a black mall, bro. All right, and you mentioned sports in high school too. Mm-hmm. Uh, what sports was you? I kn- I know, but still, what sports was you playing? I uh. I, I mean, I played organized football. I liked football more than I liked anything. Like, I played football mm-hmm. from, like, we, like I said, when we when I would go out, we would play football from early in the morning till late at night, bro. You know, baseball sometimes, but that was just because we would just, somebody else wanted to play baseball. But football was my sport of choice. We hooped. I was good at basketball, but I just liked football more. Even though, like, if you see me, you'll be like, why you ain't hoop? I liked football way more than I liked basketball. Hmm. So I played quarterback. 
Um, I started playing football for the Berkeley Steelers. And the reason I played for them because uh, my favorite team is the Pittsburgh Steelers. So Berkeley Steelers, of course, I wanted to wear that helmet. And then um, from there I went to Oak Park and I started playing quarterback for them in like 10th grade. And 11th grade, no, 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 10th grade I started on JV. 11th grade I was a backup. And then senior year I got to start for like the first three games. And then I got hurt. And then the other dude came in who actually started 11th grade, but he was such a good athlete that they was like, all right, bet. He he started 11th grade year, but then it was like, all right, Josh done bossed his game up so we can use this guy because he was like one of the fastest people I've ever seen in my life. Shout out to Byron Murrow. Like I literally got hurt third game of my senior year, and he went and scored like six touchdowns in a game. And that was like some type of record in Michigan, and I never saw the football field again. So, Hilarious. Yeah, it was cool. My GPA wasn't good enough for me to stay on the team no way, so I eventually was going to be out the way. Mm-hmm. But um, football is my sport of choice. All right, so football, and then that's a heck of a lesson too, as they say, the next man up culture. And you in an industry that's built on like keeping a good, you know, strong regard and chip on your shoulder about how you stay moving and ready for the next man up. Do you think at that early age, seeing that, uh, knowing the whole culture of it, you know, uh, prepared you for a lot of how you take and approach the stage and being ready for something like that? Talking about football. Yeah, I mean, losing, losing your uh, starting position because of injury, because they say you should never lose your spot because of injury, but we know mm-hmm. the reality is different. But do you think that kind of prepared you for a little bit of what comedy's like? Probably, but I think uh, comedy, in, in, in a sense, prepared me for everything. Comedy made me better as far as, like, dealing with, like, I don't think, like, the kind of turbulence and – the nose and the stress and uh, stuff now like comedy prepared me for all this like made me better made me like oh if i was like this when i played football i would have made it mm-hmm. i wasn't ready like as a kid like and i just made it through life just making it through life but comedy really prepared me for everything life had to offer to be like hey people ain't gonna like you and that's cool and the fact is you can have a set that kills and you know it kills a hundred percent of the time but some days it just don't work and it don't mean you ain't bad it don't mean you terrible it just mean it didn't work keep going and comedy ultimately prepared me for everything you know what i'm saying none pre- i mean i mean i just i don't know you either got it for, with comedy or you don't i don't think none can prepare you for it i just don't think none, like it's a different animal and once you in here you know it's for you and you run with it so mm-mm. and i think as long as I know you, always talented. You know, I remember, you know, meeting you. This was years back, maybe two, three years into me doing comedy. Two thousand and we talking maybe two thousand five, two thousand six. Yeah, I started in two thousand six. So yeah, at, be uh, early. at Black Star Bookstore. Oh and this yeah. This was back when. Uh, Shout out Malik Yakini. Right now, people kind of know it is uh, the place next to Simply Casual, yeah. where Simply Casual yeah. does their like uh, mark their Livernoy Market and everything. But mm-hmm. for a long time, that was Black Star Community Bookstore. Yeah, I remember and, that. And uh, Andwele, uh Money Wells, as people know. Shout him. out to Mun. So I Money heard Wells that name would in a long do time. A, a spot where he would feature different acts to do open mics. So he would have sometimes have some comedians, yeah. sometimes rappers, poets, basically whatever you wanted to do right there on Livernois and out of drive. And this is before, you know, a lot of the things that are happening on Livernois now was even happening. That's where I originally met you. That's where I was like, yo, this kid is dope. Bro, now that you brought that up, I forgot about Money Wells and I'm so sorry that I have in that spot. Livernois, that spot is legendary for comedy. And I'm gonna just say comedy and for everything, but I'm gonna just mm-hmm. say comedy because from Money Well spot to the Hunter Supper Club up the street, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, nineteen seventeen Bistro, which ain't there no more, and mm-hmm. it was like, and then you think Baker's up the way, mm-hmm. like that spot has literally that whole strip been legendary for comedy. That's what I want to say. And me thinking about that now, what you bringing up Money Wells and in the in the, in the in the bookstore, it was like, wow, bro, that was where a lot of us, because comedy, when I started, was kind of dead. Like, when I say dead, this was the era when BET's Comic View was not really on, it was coming on like that no more. Def Jam was over with. And I'm just talking about urban comedy was just no longer existing, yeah. and Coco's had closed down. Yeah. So when you was a new comedian, I literally started when it was nowhere to go but JD's House of Comedy, Blackberries, and that was it. So that's literally two days out of seven. 
Mm-hmm. So we had nowhere to go. And we started going to those kind of spots where Money Wells was like, all right, come on, you're a comedian, you can go up. And then they uh, started the Hunter Supper Club, which was some poetry stuff. And they was like, all right, we like y'all comedians. And it was just like those spots made our, this new generation of comedians in Detroit. They all went through there. And, and at I, the time, y'all was new. Not y'all OGs, but yeah. like um, you talking like you, Mike Heather, Larry, Mike Larry, Jay Alexander, Clayton Thomas, yeah, uh, Blackberry. Uh, who else can I name? Like, if you talk about pillars in the game right now in the city, mm-hmm. they will tell you that the the poetry society or community opened up to us and was like, "Come on." Because mm-hmm. I'm and sure for the mic yeah. for you all to work out your beats. They didn't have to because we don't let yeah. them come do our stuff. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? They could easily, even though they did have their rooms where it was like, this strictly poetry. But for some reason, me, they would let me do it. Maybe not mm-hmm. everybody, but if it was, if a spot was strictly poetry, they'd be like, yeah, come on, you can do it, Josh. Yeah, Larry, you can do it. It was certain people that they would allow us to do it, which was weird. And I don't know, maybe just because we was, they just messed with what we talked about. But they could easily have been like, no, nah, this is strictly con- uh, poetry. And because we definitely was like, you know, comedy is, psh, we boot, no, nah, ain't no improv here because it's straight standard. Now, when you talk about the straight stand-up vibe of it, the confidence to do this, what led you on the mic in the first place? And bro, I'm super insecure, but I'm going to say this. I'm going to take you all the way back to when I graduated high school and I moved to Mississippi uh, because I had my heart broken, broken and I was, a real, I was a real soft dude, and I still am. In reality, though, that, that first heartbreak, I think, hit men hard. Not saying that the first heartbreak don't hit women hard, but I know. Her, first heartbreak for men generally is uh, detrimental. Yeah, especially when you're doing your thing, sex involved, when you, you know, it's your first time. So it just broke through me for a loop. So I jumped in the, on the Greyhound and moved out of Mississippi. And I knew, because, okay, just to rewind, because we got way ahead of, of this story. Just to rewind, once I realized I wasn't going to go pro at football, I was like, what do I love to do? And I always have been the funniest person no matter where I was, no matter what school I was at, no matter where I hung out at, I was the dude who was on. I think in life you realize who you are. You got guys. Like, it's almost like a sitcom. It's the cool guy. This is the bully. This is the smart guy. This is the cute girl. This is the smart girl. This is the, the silly guy. And I was always the funny guy. I could never shake that 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 uh, reputation. Like, I just naturally was funny, and I couldn't help. That's what it was. So... Go back to high school or middle school, and I was always the funniest dude. And then they, I started hosting like the pep rallies and stuff like that, because I, they, you know, they was like, I remember the uh, the AP English class was putting together the, home, uh, the homecoming, and they wanted me and this dude named Tuck. We was the two funniest dudes. They was like, we want y'all to host it. Tuck kind of backed out. Only reason I was gonna do it is because it's gonna be two of us. He backed out. I didn't know it. Because I was gonna say that's a lot of pressure at that age. Boy, I'm talking about 17 years old. No, no, no. I take that back. It wasn't the pep rally. It was the Black History Month program. And they was like, you and Tuck going to host it. And I was like, all right, bet. I'll do it, Tuck. Funny, I'm funny. Tuck backed out. They was like, Josh, it's just you and this girl named <laughs> Ebony Reed from the AP class. I was scared as ever. And uh, they rented me a Tux, and I did it. And, bro, I went up there, and I literally just was like, I ain't had nothing prepared. I just was introducing people. And they and it was an assembly, so everybody that wanted to go could leave class. So everybody came. And, bro, I literally got off. Like, time out. Let me say this. Yeah, you get an opportunity to leave class in high school. You doing ain't it. No, yeah, ain't, ain't no you may. You doing it. You definitely doing Everybody it. Everybody like, all house. right, whatever. Yeah. We'll go sit in there. So, and I mean, I went up, had my little suit on, bro. My hair wasn't cut. I had braces looking dumb. And I'm talking about, bro, I went and went off. I remember one thing. I had my man watch on. Somebody watch. I just put it on. And I said this. And this was, I don't know why this was funny back then. But cash money was huge. And I was like, uh, what did I say about my watch? Uh. I said something about my watch, bro, and it was something. It was some line from uh, Cash Money song, and that place erupted, bro. And I was like, I don't know what this is, bro, but I, was trying, I promise you for the rest of my life, I'm going to do this. And from there, that's when I was like, I want to do comedy, dog. And then I was like, it was like this secret thing of mine. And then the teacher, Miss Simeon, my broadcasting arts teacher, my 12th grade year, pulled me to the side and was like, Josh, let me talk to you. She pulled me to the office. And we, you know, broadcasting arts was fun because we would shoot videos. We had cameras and stuff like that. So we would make commercials and do stuff. And I was already funny. And she was like, Josh, would you want to do stand up comedy? And I looked at her like she was stupid in my head because everybody here, stand up comedy is corny. That, like, even in my head at the time, and I understand why people feel this way, even though now I know it ain't. 
And I was like, no, nah, it's just crazy. And but in the back of my mind, I was like, I do. But I just was like, in my head, my first reaction was to turn it down. I was a 17-year-old kid. We hate everything. Man, that's corny. Get that out of my face. I went to my girlfriend at the time, who was in the, who was a sophomore, who she ain't had no real ambition in life and about dreams and none of that. So I went to her and was like, hey, um, and I made up a story. I was like, hey, uh, why Miss Simeon say she can give me on comic view? Just to, I juiced it up just to see. I ain't just say she was gonna give me see, like put me on some comedy. Just in general, I was like, what if she can put me on some famous stuff? I was like, yeah, she can put me on comic view. My girlfriend at the time was like, you ain't even funny like that for real. I was like, yeah, you right. And I just went with her, but a little bit of my heart was broken. I could have changed her whole life if she would have just backed me on that bro because <laughs> if i would have started comedy at 17 dog <laughs> it would have been a wrap by the time i was 25 bro she'd have been straight but yeah so i don't know how i got to telling this story but yeah man comedy uh comedy kind of was always in my life i always wanted to do it and then i moved to mississippi and was like i'm gonna start comedy out of out of, out of town because if I'm not going to be good, I'd rather be good in front of people I don't know. And I never started when I got down there. Even though I did all the information, I went to the library and got books and using the internet, Google Maps. So I'm printing out Google, like literally maps mm -hmm. of comedy clubs, like the uh, the comedy club, the Star Dome in Alabama, this one in New Orleans, and all these places in in, in where I'm at. I'm like, I'm going to get a car in Mississippi, and I'm going to drive to all these spots and start comedy. Never did. So I moved to Mississippi to start comedy, and then I moved home. And that's when it happened, when I came back. All right, so when you came back, also Clayton Thomas right now, uh, a lot of people may know what he's been doing like online, YouTube, uh, yeah, catching on, and it, it's a lot of the cats like now, you know, L.A. We were just out there in L.A. Yeah, it's a lot of the cats from Detroit that are out in L.A. But as you saw and you knew some of the people, but I definitely want to bring up the Clayton thing because Clayton was in school with you, right? Clayton went to Old Park with me. He was, uh, if I was a if I was an O two, he might have been one two. He might he won the O three. He's O four. He might have been two years behind me with Dez. Mm -hmm. And he was not a funny guy, but he just was a regular dude. Who knows what happened after I left? But mm -hmm. basically, like I said, after I did this whole uh, leaving and coming back, got my heart broken and got my heart broke down there. Came back to the crib. Mm -hmm. Clayton, me and my boy Booney was up at uh Wayne State just just lo just loafing around. We ain't had no direction. I was working at the car wise. We just floating around. We was just staying on campus with my boy just cause it was he had a dorm. We didn't go there. We was trying to maybe run into some girls. Come back. Clayton, Mike Leary, uh Clipperman, Blackberry, and then was doing a talent show as comedians at this uh at this thing on campus in Wayne State. So I just happened to run into Clayton down there handing out flyers to a show that they was doing. They was also promoting something they was doing outside of the campus on another day, but they was a part of this show. And Clayton was like, Josh Adams? And I was like, yeah, what up? I didn't remember him like that. Yeah. He was like, hey, bro, I, I'm a comedian now. And he had to be like, if this 06, he literally had to be like a year or two into doing this. This is the crazy part. Probably mm -hmm. a year. He's like, man, I remember telling people, bro, you was the funniest person doing comedy. You was the funniest person growing up in high school. And you the reason I started comedy. And I don't know how That's that was funny. crazy. Like, I was like, oh, he's like, and I always told people, if I ever saw you again, I was going to try to get you to do comedy. And I was like, and the crazy thing about it, I've been thinking about it. So this was just like, this was just like God, basically, that's mm -hmm. happening. So I took his flyer and was like, all right, bet. He, well, hit me up. And then I remember going to the watching the talent show and them over there doing comedy and I'm sitting there looking at it like they was funny but I was more jealous than anything that they was up there doing it and then I think I might have just went to a couple of his shows after that that they did it uh they did a show at the Dynasty over there on Eight Mile it's something different now it did okay it used to be yeah the Dynasty they was doing that's when Blackberry was doing uh Mandy's yeah that's also uh, i'm i'm pretty sure y'all probably went to tony roney's spot because yeah, tony 47 was, 46 or something like that yep and you all probably went to this kind of shows spots. like how much i was knowing with with comedy that's back when kool-aid may have been doing the ebony showcase lounge i think he was uh somebody had ebony showcase when i was around what i don't even somebody else i don't think kool-aid was doing it he was just closing it out at one time but man that's when everybody was it was little bar spots we was hitting but I remember them was the first two spots, and the first spot I ever did comedy at here was at the Music Box, and it's something totally different now. And um, I remember going there and watching them do comedy and seeing everybody that I know now as good friends of mine being like, and everybody would bring somebody up like, oh, you seen them on Def Jam? And I would believe them. Like, wow, mm -hmm. I never seen them on that Def Jam, but I just thought that was an episode <laughs> I missed. But I just found out they would just say that to make people pay attention. Like, these dudes ain't been on no TV before. 
And everybody was just so funny. And I was like, wow. And I wasn't even laughing. I'm watching from the perspective of, oh, that was funny. That was funny. That was funny. And then Clayton finally was like, when you going to go up? And I was like, this was like May-ish, March, whenever Labor, when is, Labor Day is when? Memorial Day is in May. That's so what it was. Labor Day is September. It, it was, it was, it was, it was, late. you say, what? Which Memorial one Day. Memorial, Memorial Day. And um, I was like, man, I remember it was like in May-ish. And I was like, man, I'm going to go up in January. And this was like May. He was like, if you ain't going to go up now, you ain't going to never do it. Come next week. And I came, I went up. And I ain't stopped doing comedy since the 06 of May. Like, bro, like, I literally been going up all the time, bro. The longest I might have went without grabbing a mic four days hmm. since then. So within that, grabbing the mic and what it is, uh, also father now, you know, you had a yep. child between then. Um, mm-hmm. And just growing up in comedy and, and mm-hmm. connecting with so many people, working in and out of town and just seeing this scene develop. Mm-hmm. Um connecting and doing work with uh, who we mutually know. If you listen to the Josh Adams podcast, one of our most listened to podcasts on the network, you'll definitely hear Dez. <laughs> so like, connecting with Dez, Kid Clever. Uh, what's what's the, like, how, how how did you start? What were your premise for jokes when you started? How has that changed now as you've grown older? Uh, I think, grow, I mean, like, it probably is the same process I got now where, it came from my life, and I kind of exaggerate what happened a little bit. So it was like, oh, this happened to me. I remember like one of my first jokes I got from somebody, was, which probably is terrible now, but we had phones called Sidekicks back in the day. Like it was just a phone. It was kind of like, you know, it was a, it was more of a, it was a phone, and you, it was like a PDA. You kick it around. Yeah. And you right type, now, it more for like texting. For, yeah. So people, most Detroit is different listeners, you know. PDAs was like the first pocket computers you could have. Right now, yeah. you, ain't no need for a PDA because smartphones yeah. are... It was like, know. it was the prototype to like, oh, we can do more with our phones than just yeah. talk on them and, you know, receive and take text and all that because you can get on the internet with them. And then I remember I wrote this joke about like, yeah, this dude sold me a sidekick and I was like, all right, bet. He's like, all right, give me $50. And he kicked me from the side or something like that. And it was like, I got a big joke because I kicked the stool and everything. So I was like, oh, I can take stuff from my life and make it funny. And that's just what it was. It was like I had nothing else to pull from but my life. So I'm only doing that more now. I'm getting better at it, and I'm getting more comfortable with telling the uncomfortable truth about my life. Back then, I would only tell the, the shiny side of it, like, oh, okay, this stuff here. Now it's like, hey, I'm, uh, infidelity, you know what I'm saying? I do different stuff here. I I, I fall short of different stuff, and I kind of make fun of that stuff. So, I mean, I just talk about my life, and then I improvise within all of that. So that's really where my comedy comes from, just living my life. You know I mean? I can't really – Say it no other way. You know what I'm saying? So with the how has the vision come together as far as like your projects? Because you podcast now. Yeah. Uh, you just finished working on a movie and you've worked on different projects yourself. Like where do you see creativity going as content is becoming more and more sought after just an entertainment period? Well, the way I feel about it now is, I mean, I used to be like, oh, I want to get on TV. Then I got on TV and that didn't do nothing. Like when I got on Apollo, I'm like, oh, I'm about to blow up. But it was only a big deal for like three days. And mm-hmm. then after that, it was like, oh, don't nobody care that I was on TV no more? And then it was like, all right, now I got to figure out other stuff. So I realized it's now where content going is just about feeding the base of people that really like what you do. The people mm-hmm. that feel like, you know, you, they Kevin Hart. I only say that because that's the that's the guy that everybody think about when you think about comedy. So, But it's people out here that don't like him. Mm-hmm. And that's they right to not like him. So just like it's they right to not like me. So it's just like, all right, I just got to feed the people who think I'm the funniest thing that God ever made. So I'm out here trying to produce. That's why I'm doing this podcast. Uh, I'm going to produce a game show. I want to uh, put movies out, shorts. I want to do television shows. Like, And if I got to do that all through YouTube and, or just whatever other other entity, like I, we got our own, like I, you helped me record a comedy album. And mm-hmm. I put that out through an a, a, a independent distributor online. It's like that's how I'm going to get my stuff out to people who want it. And that's that's where I'm at with it, man. It's like I just wanna, I want I want to just put stuff out, and I want to make people favorite stuff. I want people to be like, man, this is my favorite stuff. I want you to hear this dude named Josh Adam. Now, along that way, we do business, but how do you pick and choose who to do business with? As people see you, you're immensely talented. You know, I and I'm not just saying that. I mean, that's why I'm doing business with you. Yeah, but you're good to do business with as well. But how do you pick and choose who? to trust and who to take a deal from because if it ever were an industry uh 
just from what I've learned in music and still making content, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors in this industry, as they say. Yeah. It's a lot of people that just, you know, will sell you a dream. And then sometimes people may have money but really don't have the vision to make it happen. And sometimes people don't have the money, but they have a vision to make it happen. Yeah. And then sometimes they may have the money and the vision, but it just doesn't work because it doesn't connect with the right audience. How do you know who to do business with and how do you manage that? Good. Good instincts, bro. And um, just a vibe. Like, I'm a weird person. Like, I don't know if I've always been an introvert, but now I'm to the point where I don't like people. Or I probably never have really liked people. Just being insecure in life and, like, thinking people already don't mess with me. I only kick it with people who I can vibe with and be like all right cool like so once I kick it with you you literally like family to me and it's like all right bet like like you and like uh uh Dez aka Kid Clever and um like if you see me with somebody bro it's like I trust them with everything like like hey bro you if I had to, hey you can watch my daughter if I needed to I call you like bro you watch my daughter because I trust you that much and vice versa if you needed me like I said right now you can throw a million dollars on the table you're gonna come back it ain't gonna be a dollar missing because I rock with you the same way that I feel you gonna rock with me so like I mean it, and I and I'm gonna stop speaking because I mean I speak a lot of stuff into existence hey man my team came together organically the way God wanted it to so it's like I didn't force no relationships. They all came about naturally. These was people that I just like being around. And then I was like, oh, Kari got a, like, Kari know what he talking about business-wise. Like, you know what I'm saying? I trust what he say. He said do this. And I was like, all right, man, I trust Kari, so I'm going to take your word for it. Because I'm cool with being like, I understand and I don't know something. I realize it's stuff about certain things that I don't know. And I know you understand. And the respect is there because you like, it's stuff that you don't know about what I do. Like, as far as comedy, you're like, all right, I don't really know comedy on the ins and outs of it. I just know enough to know this much, but I know Josh know more. And when somebody is got the humility to be like, I don't know everything, I'm like, cool. I can respect that because I'm I'm ready to give it up. Like, bro, I don't know nothing about physics. So if you know more about it than I do, cool. I'm going to respect you and take your word for what you say. So that's how I go about it, man. Just like all vibes. And once the vibe is there and I feel it's right, I mean, I may get burnt like that. I haven't yet, but my whole thing is... I can trust you, and I and I rock with you. I'm always gonna go that route like that. How do you think uh, as as we hear different things and offering culture in the city of Detroit, and that's why we're doing the Detroit is different festival kind of to present more culture in the city and have a think tank about how it's delivered. How do you think the audience here receives comedy? As right now, it's packaged in different ways. Uh, we got Punchline Club, which is offering to a more urban audience, yep. which is to me, aka black audience. Mm -hmm. uh, you also have in Royal Oak, you have um, Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle. Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle. How, how do you think Detroit receives comedy? How do you think it's delivered? W what's going on with the audiences? Uh, what, what's the feel like here? I think comedy in Detroit is needed because it's a it's a city full of hardworking people. And we got problems and we need our stress relief like anybody else. And comedy is a stress reliever. And I believe comedy is received very well, but... You have to be very good at it for people to mess with you here. Like, you know, I mean, of course, in the black rooms, it's harder than white rooms because, you know, in the mainstream rooms, they're more open for it. But if you're not funny, they ain't laughing. But in the black rooms, you're going to deal with a different type of energy, a different type of pressure. But I really think that uh, comedy in Detroit, if you're good at it, you're going to be better than anybody anywhere else at a high level. You're going to be at a higher level because... They just a different, like I say, like the audience here is like sandpaper, bro. Like, why you up there doing it? They refining you. Like, they rubbing sh 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 whatever it is. It's refining whatever it is you doing to make it better. So when you are good from here, you literally one of the best to ever do it. Whether you make it out of here or not, you're going to be known as one of the best to ever do it. And if you go anywhere else, you'll find out, like, wow, I'm really good at this. So, like, the audiences here are harder. They want it, but you got to just be Great. And I, like I said, it might be because we such a hard working place that people like, hey, man, if I'm working hard to spend this money, you need to be at the top of what you're doing. So I think it make you better. All right. This is just like the guilty pleasure question. Mm. It's a lot of people that think they're funny. Mm. What's the difference between a person that's funny? Because I think I can tell the joke here and there with timing versus on stage stand up. Because it's a lot of people with that in their gut that's like, I'm funny. I can I can try this. Like the, you know, rest in peace, Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid used mm -hmm. to always say that. Like it is a hard art form that people really don't get a credit to it for. No, What's they, the difference? They don't. Now you said the time. Uh, you said the What's difference, the difference between, between somebody... like the funny person at the job or 
you know, in your neighborhood, your funny uncle mm-hmm. versus that stand up. Well, the difference between it uh, is, is is like situation. Like I know a lot of dudes who was funny in school, and like you got to think about how comedy. Like you got to think about what's being funny in school. We all sitting in desk and we facing the chalkboard. So if somebody make a fart sound behind you, you turn around, you gonna laugh. It's like wow, that came out of nowhere. I wasn't ready for that. So you, this is crazy. And then, and the difference is when you do comedy, the whole perspective shift because. Now everybody ain't your back ain't turning everybody and you ain't just taking everybody off guard and yelling out no crazy stuff. Now people are staring at you like, all right, bro, it's on you. Do that. You know what I'm saying? And it's just a total difference. Like I said, from being just a guy who happened to me do something at a moment or, you know, all right, you just a bad kid. Just break like you breaking the monotony up or something else where it's like, nah, bro, you the whole focal point of what's going on. Like, it's a huge difference, bro. I've watched people, bro. Like, it's just funny seeing people who, yeah, think they can do it. And then they get up there and find out it's not what it's all cracked up to be. It's not. Like, it's it's one thing doing videos at the house and in front of your camera and editing something in a certain way that you've seen somebody else edit before you and do it. It ain't the same as going up on stage and doing comedy in front of three or 3,000 people, bro. It's just a different timing. It's like turning that whole audience into one being. Like, they're all one thing right now. You have to make them act on one accord. And you basically pulling thoughts out their head or putting thoughts in their head to make them re- react, react. You know what I'm saying? In a certain way. Like, all right, bet. I got to make these people react. And it's it's, 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 it's like magic. It's, it's just crazy. Like, it's, it's almost hard to explain. It's, it's, a, it's a mix of science and it's a mix of, and a mix of magic. It's almost like you can kind of create it to a, you can almost kind of like all right to a certain extent i can make this happen but then it's like this point where it's the unknown and it just happens and you got to be able to master that so it's weird and, and one of the things rest in peace kool-aid again yep. he, he always would present different things as I, i'm always offering some events some culture and i'm like okay jokes could go here jokes could go there and he always say well people got to be ready for whatever that stage is yeah even and you know in the, in the grand scheme of things you know the promoters or people audience feel like you should be able to do whatever you want to do on yeah. the spot like sometimes you know as a comedian you meet a person and then the next thing they say tell me a joke yep. and it's like okay so what did that even people try to slag comedy people do a bunch of stuff like hey man we're gonna have this and that and that and, hey bro i just want to put some comedy in there somewhere it's like all right and you know if you need the money you're gonna do it but sometimes you want to do comedy in the atmosphere where it's conducive for comedy like I'd rather not be outside with a bunch of people standing up and they barbecuing and there's kids running around. I'd rather be comedy requires people to pay some type of attention to what you're doing and follow what it is you're saying because it might be it's almost like watching a movie. If you miss like most movies, every scene is important. You can't miss a scene. Like if you show up 10 minutes late, you're probably not going to like the movie because it's something you missed. Mm-hmm. And comedy is important in the same sense where every word is important if you're dealing with a good comedian. And if you miss it, you might miss in the grand scheme of things, the the punchline at the end or whatever the whole, all right, the point of what I was talking about. So you don't want nobody to break your distraction. You know what I'm saying? Break break your, you know what I'm saying, the attention that you're putting on the comedian. So it, it is some spots. Like, even though we arrogant as comedians, like, man, I can be funny anywhere. Just certain spots, like, you know, like Kevin Hart did, Philadelphia Eagles, the stadium in Philadelphia, it was like, that probably wasn't the best comedy show people went to. They probably was like, oh, we just coming to this big event just to come because Kevin Hart is big enough to do it. But the best comedy shows is the one where it's like, all right, you can pay very good attention and you don't have to stare at the dude on a jumbotron. You looking at this person, his facial expressions mean everything. Everything means something. Every gesture, every alliteration, even every little, uh, you know what I'm saying, accent to words and stuff like that. So, And you're like one of the things I like about you and how Kool-Aid would do. And Coco's great at this, too. And this is where I noticed the difference in some of the younger comedians and the people working out their beats with it. Because, mm-hmm. like, it's weird when they say comedians kind of have a beat like a drummer. Mm-hmm. You have a good pace where it's not fast. Mm-hmm. I feel like when people start running fast, it's like, ah, they just trying to get through the joke because they feel like it's crashing or whatever. They're they not committing to whatever they're going to say. Mm-hmm. You know, you, Coco, and Kool-Aid, I always like where – you all let the joke breathe through. Yeah, I heard somebody like somebody compared me to a uh a a jazz a jazz saxophonist or something like that. Somebody who was good at like freestyling or just like kind of making it up. I think it was something like it might have been a jazz 
some had something to do with jazz, but it was just like, yeah, man, you like a jazz musician, bro. Like the way you kind of just, you know, your beats and the way you make up stuff here and there and you come around, it's kind of like you just going. So like, you know, I don't know, man. Like, I think it's just natural, man. I think some of your favorite comedians are people who are just naturally funny and they didn't know. Like, I, I mean, if you think you're funny, I think that's corny to me. Like, like, I don't think I'm funny like that. I know a lot of people that's funnier than me. And honestly, the funniest people to me is people that ain't even comedians. Like, it's my boy Booney is super funny. Like, he just a regular dude. Mm-hmm. Just a regular dude. He could not go on stage and be funny at all. But he just funny. We just kick it and he funny. And I think he way funnier than me. So it's just like, I don't, I think, I think people who think they funny, I think that's corny to be like, I'm trying to be funny. Or if you think you cool, that's corny. Like, people who cool just happen to be cool. They don't think they cool. You know what I'm saying? So I just look at comedy the same way. Like, if you walk up to Coco, Coco, one of the funniest human beings on the planet. But I don't think Coco really thinks she's funny. I think she's like, I'm all right. Like, you know what I'm saying? But, mm-hmm. you know, I just come with being naturally funny. I think that pacing come with people who naturally. Like, people who rush through, they are uncomfortable with silence, and they don't think they funny. They mm-hmm. like, they like, all right, I'm not comfortable because they ain't laughing yet. And it's like, honestly, real... Like, when you really, really, really good and you're on some master's level com- at, at this comedy stuff, and I ain't saying I'm at the master's level, but I work hard and I've been doing it a long time, I think you don't even chase the laughs no more. I think you like, all right, they're going to laugh. You know, it's going to come when they come, and it do it happen like that. So it's like, you know, we don't, you don't chase the laugh. It's going to find you. All right, so as we wrapping up, I definitely want to tell people, listen to that Josh Adams podcast, yes. real cool episodes. It's definitely after dark. so uh, We be cussing, so don't listen to it on speakerphone unless your people around that be on that tip. Yep. We talk about a lot of stuff, but we just be having fun, man. It's just what my truth yeah. be, you know what I'm saying? And you've had some real cool guests over time. A lot. Uh, one of my favorite, Crazy Ryan Taylor. Uh, shout out for yeah. <laughs> And that's why I like my podcast, man, because I ain't out here chasing guests. Like, I ain't out here like, oh, let me get cash dial or try to get the next whatever i i feel like my format was i'm gonna get people i like talking to to come on the show we're gonna have really good conversations and the people that's listening gonna be like wow they're gonna be into it and they're gonna tell somebody else because you if you just hear a good conversation you want to listen in and be like oh this is just two this is just three four five people having a, a a very interesting conversation and it's entertaining and that's why people just love to come back and people love to listen and by that time next thing you know uh Somebody like Trump might want to come on and I have him on and I'm going to talk my talk with him because he came on my platform. Let's have that conversation or whoever might be big, Cardi B or whatever. They're going to want to be here because we just had good conversations. Not we chasing you. You're going to want to be here because it's a place you want to come kick. It. Yeah. And I, I'm, I've am i been a guest like maybe what would you say, like one third of the episode. Bro, you was on there. You was yeah, pr- yeah. practically so, a, in, uh, it. Part so of the I'm in it. So, you know, and Lord knows he. It's been some real interesting conversations where I have to stop some of your guests and say, all right, that don't make no sense. Yeah. Mostly women because they don't know what they're talking about half the time. But, but that's cool. Uh, but that classic JD episode is definitely. Oh, one yeah. Ones. Yeah. If you want to go listen back to some podcasts, go listen to JD. and He tells a story about how he got seven baby mamas and, ain't, ain't, and he ain't had no fault. Responsibility in for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's crazy. a good talk, man. Y'all should definitely so, tune in and buy tickets. Come to the festival, man. We're going to do a live podcast. I'm not going to announce who my special guest going to be. I'm working on it. It's going to be somebody local, big, very influential. So you're going to want to be there, and uh, we're going to have a good time, bro. All right, so here go the classic Detroit is different questions. I got three. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change up the order. Okay. What was your very first car, and what was the year make? What was the year making model of the car, and what year did you get it? All right, the year making model of my car, it was a 1997 Jeep Wrangler. Okay. And I got it in O. The end of 05, beginning of 06, because I had just got my heart broken. My dad drove up because he was kicking with a chick up in a he, – he, he, he took a train all the way up to a, a Benton Harbor, Michigan, to get this car because it was a chick mm. he was kicking it with. And she literally gave him the car. He drove it back. It had like 12,000 miles on it. And mm. by the time he got back, I was just getting off work. I drove his car back to the house, and I was like, I'm moving back to Michigan. He's like, What? And I literally jumped in that car with my work clothes on, gave him my Wendy shirt, and was like, take that back to them, tell them I quit. And I drove my Wrangler back up to the crib. Time out. <laughs> you gave your dad my work shirt. your work shirt and told him to take it back. Told him I quit. Tell That's him I quit, uh, cuz. That is, uh, how old were you? 20. I started comedy at 21. So I was 20. Yeah, that's, that's definitely like a move. Like That's like a... Uh, uh, a declaration that a 20 year old would make like 
take them my shirt back and tell them I quit. Like, yeah. <laughs> like the, the manager every, just yeah. going to be like, all right, call Gary. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, bro. But in your mind, you think that it's going to leave like an impact. Bro, like, it didn't mean Who nothing. is going to do the Junior no. Bacons right now? Nobody was making the spicy <laughs> chickens, bro. I threw everything in the back of that Wrangler, bro, and drove back to okay. Michigan, bro, and Grills was playing because Grills just came out. Mm. That uh, song with Nelly and all them dog, oh, wow. yeah, that song came on like a thousand times on the way back to the crib. So uh. that was my first car making model. I got it like an '06. Wow. Uh, how long? Tinker. How long did you did it last? That car might have lasted me. That car might have lasted me maybe about a year until I slid into the back of a salt truck because my tires was bald. Wow! And that was the funny part is that I slid into straight? the back of a salt truck. I was, and I drove it all in my mama house, and. uh it was the craziest thing ever, bro. And you it think literally, that was like just that young people energy? Because that sounded like it could be very traumatic, very dangerous off rip. It was just the kind of luck I got. Because I said I slid into a truck that was supposed to make sure that I didn't slide into nothing. And then the next day, it was literally summertime. Because mm. I was like, man, I was trying to make it through the winter. Like, man, I get these tires after this. Even though being a kid, it's stupid. It's like the tires are more important when it's slick outside. Why would you wait till the summer to get tires, Josh? And I literally slid into a back of a saw truck. You do that when you're 20. Yep. And drove it all in my mama house and I couldn't really steer so it was like the weirdest drive to the crib. It took me like two hours to get it home or to my mama house. And that was it. My mama fixed the car and she drove it around for a while and then she sold it. Hmm. All right. So second question. Um, if you were the DJ after the fireworks. Woodward and Jefferson. You get to play three songs. What three songs you playing for the crowd? Uh, R.J. Watkins, King of, uh, Key to the World, because I didn't know he was from here, but that's just like one of the greatest songs God let, ever LJ. gave somebody. L.J., even though I love R.J. I said R.J., my bad. L.J., I apologize. L.J. Huh? Reynolds. L.J. Yeah. Reynolds, one of the greatest songs God ever let somebody make. Uh, uh uh, and I'm assuming it's the fireworks around here, so I probably I probably had to play uh uh boss up and get this money, blade ice wood in them. And then um uh, one more song, one more song. What would be a song that I would play that's probably one of my favorites? Um mm, cuz I'm assuming this is for people that for the people to enjoy. Well, so, it's, it's you it could be you, it could be for the people as well. Oh, well, if it's just choice. for me then forget the people. RJ uh LJ Watkins uh Reynolds. Why do I keep saying? I'm thinking about RJ Watkins. Yeah, yeah, love RJ. Shout out to RJ. Not uh, but the other uh, LJ Reynolds, Key to the World. Uh, what other song would I want to hear? Uh, Do for Love, Tupac. That's one of mine. And then, um, mm, what would be my third song that I would play that I love to death? Let me look at my phone real fast. I know I probably played it recently. Uh, uh, y'all bear with me real quick. Uh, boom, 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 boom. I would probably say. Uh oh yeah, Nipsey Hustle, Victory Lap. The first mm. song of Victory Lap. That's what's up. That song called. Yeah. All right. Last question. If you could rename Woodward after one Detroiter, who would it be? Why? If I could rename it after any Detroiter, I would name it after Kool-Aid. Because yeah. Kool-Aid was a monumental figure as far as my life in comedy and being a man. And I just think that that dude didn't get his flowers while he was here. Some reasons as his own, and then some reasons are just circumstance so i would name it after kool-aid it would be his real name which i think was tyrone right yeah tyrone yep. kool-aid right boulevard because i think that man was super important to his city yeah you know i you know i mean from when he was on your show yeah, yeah. like you said you was like damn and then that time i introduced you you was like damn Corey, you, you look cool my, <laughs> my birthday party he gave him introduction i'm like well <laughs> i ain't even go up after that like they he really put on for him but i get it man kool-aid was one of them dudes but, you know, I love Kool-Aid. I yeah. mean, Kool-Aid, um, rest in peace, uh, early on when I was doing events and everything, he was one of the people that opened up and would actually work with me. Man. You know, and joke with me the whole time, too. Knowing, so like, knowing you, was roasting. Get, you would get him for a price that you probably shouldn't be getting him oh, for, but just because he was Kool-Aid, he was cool. It. But he he would plan out stuff. I remember uh, one of the times, and then he'd be like, "Kari, you should do this, or you should do that, or you you should do this." And then sometimes he'd be like, sometimes you didn't know whether he was joking with you or not joking. And he was one of the first people I've ever seen like use facial expressions to say some of the wildest things on earth to men and women, old people, white people. It. I'm like, yo, I, I guess this is why you're talented. The most. 
the mo the craziest thing I ever seen Kool-Aid ever do, and it was like blew my mind. I don't know where we was at. I wanna say we was probably at Steve Soul Food on the second floor. Or the key club, second floor. Steve Soul dude from Steve Soul Food owned it. And um this lady was talking and Kool-Aid was talking to her and she he asked her something and she was like, Yeah, my fiance dead. And he was like, and everybody kinda of quiet. He was like, Thanks for ruining the comedy show, lady. And everybody died laughing. And it was just the way he did it. It was like, wow. It was like, it was like, how do you get out of that? And he did it. He kind of just was like, you know, you make fun of we comedians. Like he ain't mean nothing bad. But in reality, everybody was thinking, like, yeah, we having fun. Who ruined the show by hollering out her fiance did? And I was like, oh, he oh, he the truth. And he was the truth. And if I'm sure in classic Kool-Aid fashion, he took that second to pause. Yeah. And then he got into yeah. got into that. He hit it and then big laugh and then he kinda he kinda let he did it. You know what I'm saying? He just yeah. knew when to let up off of it. It was like, all right, I gotta uh you know, you keep going like you say it's them beats. And he's like, All right, I can let it go. It worked. That happened, and now we back on track. So yeah, that's what happened. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, man. I appreciate you having me on your podcast finally, man. Hey, y'all go listen to the podcast. Y'all get y'all tickets to the festival. Get the uh get the lanyard right. They can get a lanyard and come to everything. They can uh they can definitely get down with everything. Hopefully they in effect and we gonna do it. I'm excited. It's the first one, man. I think y'all should come and I think this gonna this gonna be the start of something big. So uh be there. I'm gonna be there. You know, skate it. Come to the comedy show with me, Coco, Martini Harris, um uh Jason Jamerson and Foolish. Foolish. Yep. So yep. it's like it, I, I'm scared of Detroit. This is the third one. I think I've been on all of them. Yeah, 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 and it's only getting better, man. So come to the comedy show, come to everything, man. Everything you see going, support this. Like I always tell people, don't support Detroit. Support quality stuff in Detroit because everything the producing ain't great. This stuff that we doing here is uh, of a high level, and this man is putting a lot of stuff on Thank this, you. man. So you know what I'm saying. A reason I rock with Kari is because he going bald and he a cool guy <laughs> and he still date young girls and he still trying to make it happen so he need that money so please buy tickets get them t-shirts with the squirrels on it that I had nothing to do with even though it's modeled after my joke I wish I could have had a little more input on it yes but support everything this man doing that I'm doing and anybody on this podcast is doing because Detroit is different and we all the way in effect peace <laughs>